Well, today, I told you last week I really wasn't sure, but I think today I'm closing out this series of sermons on, no, that's not in the Bible. There's been seven sermons as of today, but I think it's time to move in a different direction, and I just feel led to do that. But today's title is, Money is the Root to All Evil. Is that in the Bible? It's not? You're right. It's not. Now, I know when I announced that several weeks ago, some of you really got very inquisitive. Yes, it is. I know it is. That's right. Now, don't steal my thunder yet, okay? All right? But you're right, okay? We've probably all played the game. What would you do? What would you do if you had a million dollars? Just think about that for a moment. I can remember as a little kid being asked that question, maybe in a classroom or something. Well, a million dollars then was, isn't what a million dollars is today. But what would you do with, say, $10 million? Just think about that. What would you do if somehow you had $10 million? Well, some of you would probably pay off all your bills, and hopefully you wouldn't have that, many, that much in debt. Some of you, I believe, would try to invest it. I believe that some of you, I would hope, would see the importance of tithing that to the local church. I came across a statement the other day that, sadly enough, I think is true. Money has a way of changing people. A lot of truth to that. So does the Bible say money is the root of all evil? Most of you agree now. The Bible does not say that money is the root to all evil. Let's see what it does say as we read that passage, as the Apostle Paul is writing his first letter to Timothy. We'll start with chapter 1, verse 6 and following. Now, there is great gain in godliness with contentment. There's great gain with godliness with contentment. For we brought nothing into this world, and it's pretty... Pretty safe bet, folks. We're not going to uh, leave with anything. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmless desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money. Oh, is that what that says? It doesn't say money is the root of all kinds of evil. That's not what it says, right? Even in the original Greek translation, it says, for the love of money. It doesn't say money. There's a difference there. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and have pierced themselves with many pains. May God add his blessings to the reading, the proclamation, the understanding of his holy and blessed word. As this passage says, we all know people who have wandered from the faith, and some of them have wandered from the faith because of their love, not for the Lord, but for money. They first, at one time, loved God. But now gold is their God and greed is their creed. Did you know that there's over 500 verses in the Bible that speak to money, possessions, and greed? Now this morning I want us to look at the ABCs of a biblical understanding of money. If you're following along in the outline, you'll notice the first A, the first letter A, is acknowledge. Acknowledge that money can be evil. Now, money is not evil in and of itself, but it is a means by which we exchange value. 
For generations, the only kind of commerce was bartering. People traded one valuable possession for another. And then later, when the government got into commerce business, then they minted coins to be of a certain value. And we know that that's the system that we have today. Now today, the value of paper currency is based upon the ability of a government's treasury to guarantee that value. For instance, a dollar bill, it's really just a piece of paper, isn't it? It's just a piece of paper, but it has the signature of the U.S. treasurer on it, which guarantees the value of that piece of paper. Now, just because it's a dollar bill doesn't mean that the value today is 100 pennies, okay? That diminishes after a while. To understand money, we need to remember two things. First of all, money is simply a tool. It is a tool. It can be used for good, but it can also be used for bad. In and of itself, Money is neither good nor bad. It is simply dangerous in that the love of it can become something bad. With money, a person can do much good. But with money, they can also do much harm. We can do much good with money. With money, we can do much evil. A person can selfishly serve their own desires with money. And with money, he can generously answer the cry of a neighbor or a friend's help. And money is a lot like a shovel. It's a lot like a shovel. A shovel is a useful tool in the garden. You can dig a hole with that shovel. You can plant a tree. You can also take that shovel and hit somebody over the head with it. That's not its intended use. But we can do something good with that shovel. We can do something bad with that shovel. It's how we use the shovel that determines its goodness. The second thing to remember there. The consuming love for money is a bad root, and I would underscore consuming, the consuming love of money. If you have a thriving weed out there in the garden or in the yard, you better dig it up, and you better dig it up at its root. Uh, I guess it was uh, Labor Day. I did all kinds of work there. The house was there for hours, uh, working on the house. Karen came in, and uh, she helped me there at the very last part. She says, I need you to get that weed over there in that corner over there by the front porch. Get it up by its root. I didn't get it by its roots last time, and it's bigger now than it ever was. So I took a shovel, and I dug down into the ground to get that root. Because if you don't cut it off at its root, and you can just cut it off right there level with the ground, it's still got a root base and it will continue to grow because the root is still there. Now, the consuming love of money is just like that. If you don't destroy that root, then your life can be continuously attacked by the regrowth of greed. Money is morally neutral, but... If we are consumed with that love of money, then it can produce some pretty bad fruit in our lives. The second letter there in the ABCs, A, acknowledge, B, beware. Beware of possession, obsession. I may have used that term before. It seems like I have, but I've sort of forgotten that. No, let's face it. It's not money that people really love, is it? For the biggest part, it's not. It's the things that we can buy with that money. All the stuff. 
when our lives are driven by a desire to have more and more and more stuff, then we could very well be suffering from possession obsession. I would just love to go through our house, clear out a lot of baskets and a lot of pottery. Karen, we don't need this. Well, we might need it someday. It'll be valuable someday. <laughs> It'll be valuable long after we're gone, okay, if it's valuable at all. But I thought about this when I was working up this message, this possession obsession. Now, Americans, as you well know, can be notorious, and I have shared this phrase with you before, notorious for spending money that they don't have to buy things they don't need to impress people they don't like. Now in verse 9, the Apostle Paul writes that people who are driven by a desire to get rich can fall into a trap. Now there's three myths that we need to explore and understand today. The first myth is, that first myth, myth tells us, more stuff will make me happy. More stuff will make me happy. It's interesting that the highest divorce rates are among those that are the most affluent in our society. Hollywood acknowledges that. Myth number two, I desire it and I want it. And not only do I want it, but I want it right now. Easy credit has encouraged people to buy now and pay later, if they pay it off. Americans are drowning in a sea debt. Statistics tell us that the average American has six and a half credit cards. Six and a half. I guess you take one of those credit cards and cut it in half, okay? Six and a half. In 1991, the average unpaid credit card debt per person was $4,300 in 1991. In 2010, it had risen to $8,700 per person. And today, it is $14,000. $700. So stuff really is not what makes us happy. Many people know that, but many people find that out too late. And the third myth is more money will end my worries. I've got a friend that says there's not a whole lot you can do if you've got money. Well, there's some truth to that. But money won't take care of our worries. It won't get rid of our worries. It might even cause more. The people who seek riches and are obsessed with possessions worry about it. And they find themselves consumed by that worry. But those who seek God don't have to worry because God has promised, and we saw it right there in that scripture, to provide us with the things that are really necessary. The third letter in the ABCs, help me out. A was acknowledge, B was beware, and C is contentment. Now, it'll probably be about 12 o'clock before we get through the entire alphabet this morning, so bear with me, okay? So we're just going to, we're just going to get to C today, okay? Contentment. There's nothing like being Contented, having a sense of contentment. Contentment is the antidote for the poison of financial worry. In verses 6 through 8 that we just read, the Bible gives an antidote for financial greed. But godliness with contentment is great gain. We brought nothing into this world. And we're not going to take anything out. Some of you have seen the picture of the hearse, the funeral coach, pulling a U-Haul trailer. They don't get too far, okay? They may get to the graveyard, to the cemetery, but they're not going to take it with them. But if we have food, 
if we have clothing, if we have the necessary things, then we will know contentment. The lead singer of the Irish rock band YouTube, and I think some of you all are probably familiar with this song, particularly some of the younger people, Paul David Houston goes by a nickname of Bono. He and his sunglasses have made him very famous in the uh, music industry. In one of the songs that he wrote, the lyrics read, I have climbed the highest mountain. I have run through the fields only to be with you. I have run. I have crawled. I have scaled those city walls, but I haven't found what I'm looking for. I haven't found what I'm looking for. That last line may sum up the culture of our 21st century. I haven't found what I'm looking for. People are looking, people are searching, people are running, and they still find themselves not satisfied. And one of the biggest reasons for that is they're trying to find happiness in possessions. Contentment is an attitude. And that attitude can only come as we put our trust in God to meet our provisions. Contentment means you are resting in the attitude that God is going to meet your needs. May not meet all your wants, but God does promise, us, promise to meet our needs. Contentment is believing that God will make sure that you don't starve, that you have clothes, and you have the necessary things in life. So you will find that people who are greedy are never satisfied with the simple pleasures of life. They're always looking for more. They're always looking for what they don't have instead of appreciating the things that they do have. So let's get it right, okay? Let's get it right. Money in and of itself is not evil, okay? But the love of it can be. When we love money so much that we shove God out of the way, we shove the more important things out of the way, and that becomes what we worship, then that is a sin, and that is wrong, and we will suffer from that. Money and the toys it can buy will satisfy us. I'll be willing to say that it will satisfy us. But it's only a temporary satisfaction. There's only one thing that can satisfy us forever. And that is a real, true, genuine relationship with the Lord. Only Jesus Christ can satisfy our soul. So let me ask, are you tired? Are you weary? Are you worn out? Are you miserable? See, I believe that the Lord extends an invitation to us today. Just walk with me. How much different would all of our lives be if we just took time every day to walk with the Lord? How much different would our lives be if we purposely set aside that time to keep company with God? Keeping company, walking with him. We can learn to live freely. We can learn to live with contentment. We can learn to live with the things that won't consume us, so we've just got to have it. But remember... Money is not evil. It's necessary. We have to have it. Some of us wish we had more of it. But it's not money that's evil. But it's how we use it that determines whether it is. Let's pray. My blessing for each of you is this. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. 
May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Today we are on our seventh sermon. Probably going to be winding this up with maybe, uh, maybe two. I know one more for sure. So, and then we'll move in a different direction here. Today we're looking at that phrase that you will not find.